Hello everyone. On the 3rd of March 2023, there was a workshop in memory of Luigi Pazinetti. The workshop took place at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Um, the workshop basically lasted for the whole afternoon. Um, the title of the workshop was Value Production uh, and Structural Change, a workshop in memory of Luigi Pazinetti. The organizers of this workshop, uh, which was very good actually, um, was Ivano Cardinale and Ariel Vickerman from both are from uh, Goldsmiths College too. We teach economics together, so they are my colleagues, and they invited me to also uh, deliver a presentation at this workshop. So you can see that my name is listed here. Uh, in this video, I want to basically reproduce my presentation at the workshop because the workshop was held on campus. Um, and just in case anybody out there is curious about um, the topic that I presented, which is connected to Luigi uh, Pazinetti's work, uh, can just watch the videos. The, the slides that I have used at the workshop are already available on my website. So if you go to thomasrota.wordpress.com and then you click on slides, uh, uh, right at the top, you can see effective demand and price of production. That was the title of my presentation at the workshop. So click here and you can get uh, a copy of the slides in PDF format, as you can see, right? So uh, these are the slides that I have prepared for the workshop. Um, and uh, it was a brief presentation. It, it took about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, and that's it. So the slides are available on my website and in this uh, video I just want to reproduce my presentation in case anybody uh, is interested in this topic. Um, so I'm Thomas Rota. Uh, I teach economics at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Uh, and again, you have the address of my personal website where you can find the copy of my slides and also you will find the copy of this video uh, that you are watching right now. Uh, the title of my presentation at the Pazinetti workshop was Effective Demand and Prices of Production. Uh, it relates back to uh, a paper that I, that I published in 2021 in Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. Uh, for short, <laughs> I noticed that the editors call it SCAD so if I say SCAD, I actually mean the journal, okay? Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. Uh, that was the title of my paper, Effective Demand and Price of Production. Um, and basically the paper connects uh, Keynes, Kaletsky and Marx within a Marxist uh, framework, okay? Um, so I began by saying that one of Pazinetti's objectives um, was to integrate classical political economy and Keynesian economics. Um, there are several benefits uh, of such integration. Um, and in my presentation, I focused on two of these benefits, okay? And, and because they are the, the, the essence of, of the paper that got published in 2021. So the first benefit is that Keynes' principle of effective demand can improve Marxist models. And at the same time, Marxist value theory can improve Keynesian models. Uh, and these are the ideas that I want to develop in my presentation. Um, now, of course, the paper is addressing some issues that I have identified in the Keynesian and in the Marxist literatures. Um, and I also focus on, on the modeling, okay? So, uh, so the paper is about theory, but it's also about modeling, okay? And how the models reflect theoretical assumptions, okay? Uh, so the first uh, critique that in the paper that I make about Keynes and models is that these models usually, most of the time, not always, but usually focus on market power, okay? So they have a markup uh, function um, and that's not only in Keynesian models. Uh, when I say Keynesian, I actually include Kaletskian models too, because several Keynesian models um, actually uh, assume perfect competition. Uh, and we know that Kaletskian models assume imperfect competition. So, uh, because that's what Keynes did, right? So in the general theory, 
Uh, Keynes uh, actually assumed the perfect competition to stay as close as possible to Alfred Marshall. Um, but the post-Keynesian literature that developed after Keynes um, also incorporated elements from Kalecki. And basically, uh, one of the elements that was incorporated in Keynesian models uh, from Kalecki was the idea of imperfect competition and markups. Okay, So today, if you look at the literature, you will see that uh, Keynesian and Kalecki models, they focus a lot of, on, on market power. However, and that's something that I have uh, said many times over, uh, I believe that uh, these models actually lack uh, a value theory to explain the origin of profits. Even, I, I know that some of these models, they actually use the utility theory of value, um, in, either explicitly or implicitly, but it's common to see Keynesian models actually incorporating the utility theory of value. Um, I, I, but in any case, I still believe that uh, these models actually lack a value theory, for example, to explain the, the origin of profits. Um, so I think that uh, the Marxist value theory can actually um, provide some benefits to Keynesian models in terms of value theory. But at the same time, uh, Keynesian models and Kaletskian models, they actually have a lot to offer to Marxist theory because uh, Marxism and, and not just the theory, but actually the, the models in, in, in Marxism, they have been um, very reliant on Sen's law. And that's a little strange because we know from the get-go, from chapter one of volume one of Capital, that Marx was very critical of Sen's law, right? So we know that. So, so that, that's chapter one, uh, the commodity form, uh, of the first volume of Capital, Marx was very critical of Sen's law. We know that it's a fact, it's right there, he's very critical. Um, however, when it comes to modeling, and if you look at uh, volumes two and three of Capital, in many important instances, Marx actually assumed uh, Sen's law, uh, both in terms of mathematics, when he was trying to formalize uh, his theory, um, and also uh, in the theory itself. So it's, it's kind of strange because uh, it's obvious that Marx uh, was um, against Sass law. He was uh, arguing against Sass law, but he also <laughs> employed Sass law in many of his uh, chapters uh, and models. Okay? And uh, when I was doing my PhD at uh, UMass Amherst, the, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, my supervisor uh, at the time, Professor David Kotz, um, he mentioned something to me that uh, was very interesting. He said, oh, Marxism has a lot of says law Marxism. And I was intrigued by this because by that time, I already wanted to include the principle of effective demand within the Marxist framework. But um, when Professor David Kotz uh, mentioned uh, this uh, says law, you know, this use this terminology says law Marxism, then I got even more interested into into this. And that's why I wrote the paper. So the paper is a critique of says law Marxism, right? So the main idea is that several Marxist models uh, have too often relied on, on says law. And there are many ways uh, in which says law appear appears in, in Marxist models. So I will show you a few examples uh, through which uh, says law uh, makes an entrance into a Marxist model. So the first way that says law can appear in a Marxist model is when you have supply-driven growth, right? So many models are growth models, they are long-run models, uh, but if it is supply-driven, basically the, the author uh, is just assuming says law. Another way to incorporate Sen's law into Marxist theory um, is just to assume that all the values produced are uh, fully realized. Okay, so if you have supply-driven growth, if the values produced are fully realized, then you're basically assuming Sen's law. Another way in which Sen's law appears in Marxist theory is actually more subtle, so it's more difficult to catch, okay? So what I have written there on the slide is, is something that I, it, it, took me, it took me some time to identify, all right? So 
when surplus value precedes investment, in my opinion, that's a uh, sense law too, okay? Because it's it's very similar to the criticism that Keynes uh, had against uh, sales law. And by the way, just to be clear, sales law, Jean-Baptiste Se is not the inventor of sales law. The inventor of sales law is actually Adam Smith, okay? So um, just to be clear, sales law is name, named after uh, Jean-Baptiste Se, but he was not the first user, <laughs> the first uh, developer of uh, sales law. It was actually Adam Smith. Uh, and Adam Smith preceded um, by a few decades, uh, Jean-Baptiste Sam. But um, yeah, sales law is named after Jean-Baptiste Sam, even though it's actually Smith's law. Uh, so in the Marxist literature, I have realized that several models um, have this idea that surplus value precedes investment. All right, and for me that's very similar to Keynes saying that um, in 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 the classical economist saving uh, precedes investment. Okay, so we know that Keynes uh, inverts this causal mechanism. Uh, Keynes says in the classicals uh, saving precedes investment, and Keynes says no, it's investment that precedes saving. Um, and then I noticed that in 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 classical political economy in Ricardo and Marx. Um, they say something like, okay, the surplus uh, is accumulated and then you can use the surplus uh, for investment. From the aggregate uh, perspective, uh, right? so if you consider the, the economy at the aggregate level, uh, then I believe it doesn't make much sense okay, to say that surplus value precedes investment. Okay, I think it's the opposite. I think that if you correctly incorporate Keynes and Kalatsky into the Marxist framework, you will realize that it's actually investment that precedes surplus value, okay? Because it's the investment expenditure that realizes surplus value. Because when you say that surplus value precedes investment, then what you're basically saying is that you produce stuff, then the values are realized, and then somehow these values are realized, and then, then you can make... Uh, more investment, right? So I don't think that's correct, okay? I don't think that surplus value precedes investment. And here, and here I'm talking about um, the, the aggregate level. So the economy is at uh, the aggregate level. So I think it's, it's one of the ways in which sales law appears inside Marxism, within Marxism. It's when people say that surplus value precedes investment. And, that's a, and th that is something very, very uh, subtle. Okay, it's, it's, it's difficult to catch, but uh, it's very similar to saving preceding investment. Now, another way in which sales law Marxism um, appears uh, in the literature is when the realized rates of exploitation are exogenous. Okay, and here I stress the word realized because in Marxist theory, uh, we talk about rates of exploitation right, surplus value divided by the value of labor power. But actually, there are two rates of exploitation. There is one rate of exploitation at the point of production, and there is a rate of exploitation which is the realized rate of exploitation. So the fact that people are exploited at the point of production does not necessarily mean that that exploitation will be realized, because if those workers are producing value, so they are in that sense, exploited at the point of production, but those values are not realized, then the realized rate of exploitation will differ from the uh, rate of exploitation at the point of production. Marx is very clear about this. There are passages in the volume uh, uh, three of Capital in which Marx explains this. And he says explicitly, so if you look at my paper, I, I will give you the link to my paper uh, when I finish the presentation. When when you look uh, at my paper, I put the, the, the quote there from, from Marx in which he clearly says that uh, for values to be realized, you need consumption, you need investment expenditures, and then after you have consumption ex and expenditures then uh, and investment expenditures, then you can realize the rate of exploitation such that, and he says this explicitly, there is a rate of exploitation within the sphere of production, and then you have a different rate of exploitation 
um, that is re the real, the actually realized rate of exploitation exposed, right? So, and he says those two rates of exploitation are not identical, even though they can be equal. So, mathematically, uh, numerically, they can, they can, they could be, they might be equal, but um, in terms of the concepts, they are not identical. So, but the point here is the following. Um, what I have realized, and this is uh, this is the research that I have done. So when a Marxist model assumes that the rate of exploitation, the re actually the realized rate of exploitation is uh, exogenous, for me from the research that I have done, that basically implies uh, sense law. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain this a little bit uh, a little bit uh, better as I move on with my presentation, but remember this, okay? This is one of, I, I didn't know this before I started to to, to write this paper. Uh, I realized this when, when I was actually uh, doing the, mod the modeling and I was like, hmm, I see. So when the, re when the realized rate of exploitation is assumed to be exogenous, that is sense law, basically, okay? Another way in which sales law appears within the Marxist tradition is when the, the long-run prices of production and the socially necessary labor time are independent of demand. That's another way in which um, sales law appears in, in, in Marxist models, okay? Again, just to be clear, another way that I have identified through which sales law appears in Marxism, such that we, we can call it uh, sales law Marxism, as Professor David Kotz uh, suggested to me when I was doing my PhD at UMass, is that um, is when prices of production, which are the long run prices, and the socially necessary labor time, are independent of demand. Okay, I'm going to explain these things a little bit better. So let me move on and and show you something that um, it took me by surprise because I realized this when I was actually teaching game theory at UMass uh, many years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and I was teaching game theory and I wanted to show to the students uh, how we could apply the replicator dynamics from evolutionary game theory to model the, the equalization of profit rates uh, across companies and across sectors. And basically I wanted to show that Marx was right so I said, okay, I'm just going to develop a very simple um, model, evolutionary model using um, evolutionary game theory, uh, evolutionarily stable strategies. And I will show how the competition uh, between companies to cut costs and invest in new, um, new and more advanced technologies will lead the average profit rate to fall. So basically it, that was it. I wanted to do that, that in class. And I said, okay, I'm gonna, I didn't say this explicitly to the students, I just wanted to show how microeconomic decisions have a macroeconomic outcome that might be the opposite of what the agents intended to do at the micro level. So it was just an example of how you have these very complex nonlinear interactions between micro, macro, and then back to micro, such that uh, the agent at the micro level, the uh, they, they, take a they make a decision at the micro level, they aim to do something, but when all of them make uh, those decisions, they produce a macroeconomic outcome that is just the opposite of what they wanted, right? So individually, they wanted to increase the profit rate individually at the firm level, but what uh, after a while, what the agents actually produced was uh, a macroeconomic outcome that was just the opposite of what they expected. So the average profit rate would fall and that was my idea. I said, I'm going to build this evolutionary game model using uh, the replicator dynamics to show that. But then I couldn't, right? And I couldn't do it uh, because basically I was just trying to model exactly what Marx had done in the, in the third volume of Capital. And I couldn't do it, okay? The, the mathematics was not working. Uh, it took me a while to understand why. It was not obvious to me at the time. So I just want to show you what I have uh, found out, okay? So if you look at chapter 9, of um, the third volume of Capital. Chapter 9 is the chapter in which Marx 
discusses prices of production and how you can go from values to values to value transfers and then to the equalization of profit rates and then the formation of uh, prices of production in the long run okay uh, but there's a problem okay Marx makes a mistake in that chapter and the this mistake is very difficult to identify okay and um, and it has to do with the employment of sales law. I think Marx's mistake, uh, so he, he does make a mistake um, in chapter nine of capital three, when he was discussing the, 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 the formation of, of price of production in the long run. And basically I believe that the mistake that he made, which can be corrected. So in the paper, I basically show Marx's mistake and then I correct this mistake by developing a better model of price of production, assuming perfect competition. Um, is that Marx assumed uh, exogenous and constant uh, realized rates of exploitation. Okay, so let me explain that to you. So when you look at chapter 9 of volume 3 of Capital, uh, you will see that... Uh, sorry, <laughs> my alarm went off here. Let me just turn my, my alarm clock off. Just one second here. So... I apologize for that. So, in that chapter, chapter 9, uh, Marx assumed um, that the realized rate of exploitation was constant and exogenous. Okay, And he's doing that in his model of profit rate equalization and the formation of prices of production. Okay, So, Marx assumes from the start that the realized rates of ex exploitation are constant and exogenous, and they are basically fixed at 100 percent okay you can if you doubt me just go there open the book look at chapter 9 and see that marx assumes a constant rate of exploitation at 100 percent uh, which is exogenously given okay however uh you see the chapter is about the equalization of profit rates assuming perfect competition okay i think marx was basically assuming perfect competition so that's what i'm he doing here i'm assuming uh, perfect competition and then he is explaining how uh, profit rates equalize and then you get a uh, price of production in the long run and, he, and you have these value transfers from um, from less capital intensive companies to more capital intensive companies okay uh, however profit rates and that's the problem profit rates cannot equalize if you make the same assumptions that Marx made in that chapter okay and the, assum the assumptions that Marx made were that the capital labor ratios uh, were different across firms, okay? Actually, it doesn't matter if they're different across firms or across sectors, it doesn't matter, okay? As long as you have different capital labor ratios and, and the language that Marx uses is the organic composition of capital, so it's uh, constant and fixed capital divided by the value of labor power, that's what OCC is, right so it's um the value of constant uh, and fixed capital sorry circulating plus fixed capital so it's constant capital divided by uh, the value of labor power so that's the capital labor ratio right so marx assumes that it's uh, that it's heterogeneous so it differs ac across firms and sectors and he also assumes that capacity utilization is exogenous and constant okay and he also assumes that the realized rates of exploitation are exogenous and constant. And in that chapter, he assumes that it's uh, 100%, right? So what happens is that when Marx assumes that capacity utilization is exogenous and constant and that the realized rates of exploitation are exogenous and constant, Marx uses says law, all right? And, and it was very difficult it was difficult for me to identify that says law in that chapter was actually deriving from this assumption that the realized rates of exploitation were exogenous and constant, okay, through the transformation uh, that he was trying to develop from um, commodity values to price of production. Now, what I do in the paper is to offer a solution to this problem, because I think there is a solution, there is a very elegant solution to this problem so we need to uh, change 
some of the assumptions that uh, Marx made in that chapter. And the new assumptions, I believe, should come from Keynes and Kolatsky. And, and that's what I want to present to you. I want to do any mathematics in this presentation. In this presentation, I'm just going to show you the essence of my arguments and the essence of what is going on in Marx, Kalecki and Keynes regarding the, um, the, the determination of price of production in the long run and the equalization of profit rates, assuming all the time perfect competition. All right, so I won't show you any equations or, or because you can, it's better if you just uh, read the paper. So the solution that I propose is the following. So we can keep the main features of Marxist value theory, okay? So the unpaid labor of productive workers is the origin of profits. So, so right, so workers, uh, they, they, uh, they pay to work, and that's what I say. If you want to summarize the, uh, the concept of exploitation is that people believe that when they work, they get paid to work. Uh, when in fact it's just the opposite, they pay to work, and what they pay to work is unpaid labor. They they pay to work using unpaid labor time, and that is the origin of profits. That's what comes out of Marxist uh, value theory. Now, what I propose is to introduce Keynes' principle of effective demand in the short run, and then we have price of production, uh, which are asymptotically stable in the long run. Uh, price of production, for them to exist, they have to be asymptotically stable, uh, because I think if they're asymptotically unstable, then there's not much meaning in talking about price of production. But as I will show you, uh, it depends on the coefficients that you have. So you don't get this global stability uh, in all cases. So I have some simulations for that. So uh, in certain scenarios, the price of production are stable in, uh, in the long run, and in certain cases, the price of production are not stable. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this a little uh, bit later. But just remember uh, what I'm trying to do here. So in the long run, we have labor values, we have price of production. And in the short run, I introduce Keynes's uh, principle of effective demand uh, to realize the profit rate. So what happens when you do this is that prices and values, and when I say values, I mean labor values. So then prices and values become endogenous to effective demand. The rate of exploitation also become endogenous to effective demand. And what happens is that in a dynamic model, uh, the conditions of production are endogenous to, to effective demand. Um, I say this because uh, when you look at the Marxist literature, and that's what Marx suggests, this, suggests uh, we have this idea that the labor values are, are determined by the conditions of production, right? No problem with that, right? So labor values are determined by the conditions of production. But the thing is, um, e okay, production is taking place in a dynamic context, right? So you have overlapping periods of production. You have overlapping production spheres from different companies, okay? So in a dynamic model that incorporates time explicitly and production time explicitly, then what you realize is that the conditions of production in a dynamic si system, in a dynamic model, <laughs> if you're theorizing the system, is that, of course, the conditions of production are endogenous to effective demand, okay? So it's not, in a dynamic context, context, it's not possible to talk about conditions of production on the supply side uh, without talking about effective demand, okay? So if you have a static model which does not have time, and then you can talk about the conditions of production regardless of demand, but once you introduce time uh, explicitly, you have a dynamic system, uh, so the conditions of production, they also depend on the pattern uh, that comes from effective demand, okay? So the prices and the values become endogenous to effective demand and the realized rate of exploitation also becomes endogenous to effective demand. Um, so 
this is more difficult, okay? I explain these things in detail in the model, but um, I'll do my best to explain this point here, but I, I know it's not very easy to understand. But uh, so the idea is the following. The expected profit rate fully determines the current profit rate. Okay, when I say expected, I basically, I'm not using any concept like Russian expectations or or things like that. I'm just saying, I'm just using the word expected in the common sense that you have expectations about the future, okay? Okay, I'm not assuming Russian expectations or anything like that. I'm just using the word expectation and expected in the common sense that uh, the future is uncertain. So at the present moment, we have expectations about what might happen in the future, okay? So the idea that I developed in the paper is that the expected profit rate fully determines the current profit rate. So the expected profit rate determines the level of expenditures that will realize the current profit rate. So because profits needs to be realized, right? So the surplus value needs to be realized. But for you to realize value, you need expenditures. And expenditures, especially investment expenditures, they derive from expectations that companies have about the future. Future of what? The future profitability of their businesses. So investment expenditures at the present moment realized, they realize the values that have been produced. And that's what determines the current profit rate. But those expenditures, especially investment expenditures carried out by firms looking at the future, they are based on the expectations that those firms have about their future profitability. So the future profit rate, which is actually unknown, so it's an expected profit rate, this expected profit rate determines the current expenditures with investment from the perspective from the perspective of the companies. And those expenditures are the expenditures that will realize the values that have been produced. So the expected profit rate determines the level of expenditures, especially investment expenditures, that realize the current profit rate because they realize current profits in the short run. The expected profit rate is partially autonomous from the current profit rate because expectations depend on many things and not just the current profit rate, okay? So the expected profit rate is a function of the current profit rate, but not just of the current profit rate because you have other things that matter which are not only profits, okay? So these expectations about the future profit rates depend on the current profit rate, but they also depend on other stuff. And that makes the expected profit rate at least partially autonomous from the current profit rate. However, if you think about the, uh, if you think about reverse causality, then you, you will realize that the current profit rate can influence the expected profit rate. Okay, that's obvious. Okay, that, that is obvious. So the current profit rate can influence the expected profit rate, but the current profit rate does not fully determine the expected profit rate. Okay? One more time. <laughs> so the expected profit rate is partially autonomous from the current profit rate because expectations about the future profit rate incorporate aspects of reality which are not reducible to the current profit rate. But the current profit rate, of course, obviously, it can influence the expected profit rate. But the current profit rate does not fully determine the, the expected profit rate. Okay? I'll keep moving on. Um, and I'll come back to this uh, as, as I move on. At this moment, I need to make clear what I mean by the principle of effective demand, okay? Um, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding about what uh, the principle of effective demand is. So I'll, I'll do my best here 
to uh, explain to you what actually Keynes meant by the principle of effective demand. So what I'm going to say here might, might sound controversial to you, but I don't think it's controversial. If you go back and read the general theory, you will realize that what I'm telling you now uh, is exactly what Keynes did in the Keynesian, uh, in the, in, in, sorry, in the general theory. So one thing is what Keynes himself did and wrote, right? Another thing is how Keynesians interpreted um, what Keynes did. Those are very different things, okay? Again, one thing is what Keynes himself did in the general theory. And another thing is how the Keynesian literature and the post-Keynesian literature afterwards interpreted what Keynes was doing. And those things are very different. So I'm going to... I'm going to explain to you what the principle of effective demand is, but I'm not using the post Keynesian literature today, okay? Because I don't think they are actually using the same concepts that Keynes used. So what I'm going, going to explain to you is what Keynes did in the general theory. Clear? All right, so let's, let's do it. So I follow Victoria Chick, uh, who has recently uh, passed away. Uh, as Pazinetti did, both uh, Pazinetti and Victoria Chick, unfortunately, have passed away very recently. Um, so, if you look at her 1983 book, Macroeconomics After Keynes, he says something. Sorry, she says uh, she says something really interesting, which is that the principle of effective demand in Keynes, in the general theory, is actually better described as the principle of effective supply, okay? And when I teach this type of stuff, I usually say Keynes' principle, principle of effective supply rather than saying the principle of effective demand. Um, so I'm using the same terminology that Victoria Chick uh, used in her 1983 book, okay? The principle of effective demand is better described as the principle of effective supply because in Keynes, demand was on the supply side okay it sounds weird but it has to do with the way in which Keynes um, defined the concepts so remember for Keynes demand is on the supply side because for Keynes demand is from the perspective of the companies so today what we mean by demand is what Keynes meant by expenditures so please remember this in Keynes, one thing is demand and another thing which is completely different is expenditures. Demand and expenditures are not the same, they are not identical, okay? They could be numerically equal if expectations are correct, exposed, but in principle they are not identical, okay? I'm saying this because in the textbooks today, uh, demand and expenditures are identical, okay? In Keynes, they are not. It, demand is on the supply side because they have to do, demand has to do with the expectations of the firms before they start production. And ex post, you have expenditures, okay? So today, demand and expenditures are basically identical, but not in Keynes. Demand was ex ante, expenditures were ex post, okay? So what we mean Again, what we mean today by demand is what Keynes meant by expenditures. So, in Keynes, demand is, is on the supply side, and you can find other authors in the Keynesian literature, like Hayes, Hartwig, Allen, and Casarosa, who developed this idea too. So here I'm following uh, Victoria Chick, Hayes, Hartwig, Allen, and Casarosa. Um, what they said is published, so um, I'm using their ideas here. So let's define the terms. And these are the definitions that Keynes uh, used in the general theory. So demand, that's a definition, okay? So demand is the firm's expected revenues, okay? So demand is expectational. Okay, demand is expectational and it has to do with the expectations that the firms have before production about the revenues they will have after they have produced. Okay, so demand is an ex-ante concept 
uh, and ex ante means before production. Okay, so when I say ex post, it means after production, and when I say ex ante, it means before production. Okay, so demand for canes is before production. It's ex ante. It's an ex ante concept because it is the expectations that the firms have about the revenues that they will have exposed, but those expectations are formed ex ante before production takes place. Okay. Now, expenditures. So, expenditures are the realized consumption and realized investment exposed after production. Expenditures, as I said before, they take place after production. Okay? So, expenditures are related to realized consumption and realized investment. Okay? So, expenditures are exposed after production and demand is related to expected revenues ex ante before production. Um, supply for Keynes is the profit maximizing level of output. It's also an, an ex ante concept, okay? Because in the short run, given the technology and the cost structure of the company, the profit maximizing level of output is determined by the technology that is given and the cost structure that, that is given, okay? So when Keynes constructs the supply curve, um, he's talking about the profit maximizing levels of output, okay, for different levels of employment. Effective demand, which is at the intersection of demand and supply, so if you just see, look at the definition of demand, then look at the definition of supply, then put those two things together, because that's what effective demand is, is when the demand curve crosses the supply curve, such that effective demand is defined as the output level that maximizes expected profits. You see, the definition is a little weird, but that's what Keynes does. You see, effective demand is defined by output, not demand, in the sense of in the sense of how demand is defined today in textbooks, okay? Because as I told you, in textbooks today, demand is uh, expenditure in the in the textbook today, okay? But not in Keynes. In Keynes, in Keynes, demand is expected revenues from the perspective of the companies. So Keynes defines effective demand as the effective commitment to produce. Okay, that's what Keynes does. Effective demand is the effective commitment of the firms to produce. So he, de he defines effective demand as the output level, the supply level that maximizes expected profits. Okay, effective demand is the effective supply that maximizes expected profits. So effective demand is also an ex ante concept. Okay, effective demand takes place before production begins. Okay, remember this, effective demand takes place before production begins. And these definitions are, they, they hold whether or not expectations are correct. Okay, so everything that I have told you holds, all these definitions hold whether expectations about the future are correct or not. Okay, and demand, as I mentioned before, so demand and expenditures uh, are not identical, but they can be equal numerically when the ex ante expectations are fulfilled ex post. Okay, so demand and so demand and expenditures are not identical. They are not identical concepts. They have different definitions, as I have shown you in this slide. They have different definitions, so they are not identical, but they could be numerically equal if the ex ante expectations are fulfilled ex post. Okay? But the fact that demand and expenditures can, might be numerically equal, does not imply that they are identical. Okay, the, the definitions, the concepts are different and they're only numerically equal if the ex ante expectations are fulfilled ex post. Now, I want to introduce 
the principle of effective demand in the Marxist framework because then I can, if I do that effectively, I can accomplish two things at the same time. I can, I can show the, let's say, how the, how sense law Marxism is no longer necessary. That's, that's the first thing that I want to do. I want to show how sense law Marxism is actually wrong and unnecessary. You don't need it. Okay. And also how to apply Keynesian and Kaletskin principles within a Marxist framework because you can make Marxist theory um, better by doing this. Okay. So let's do it. I, I will show you the essence of my argument of how to introduce uh, Keynes and Kaletsky into the Marxist framework. So the first thing that happens is that expected profits determine firms' output levels at the beginning of the production period. Okay, so expectations are ex ante. Expectations matter before production takes place because I'm 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 not talking about the expectations that consumers have to maximize utility. No, I'm talking about the plans that companies make before they produce because before you produce you need to make a plan you need to make a plan about how much to produce how much people to employ how much equipment to use how many uh, plants and facilities to use and that's what i'm talking about expectations in that, in that sense i'm not talking about consumers maximizing expected utility okay it has nothing to do with that i'm using the classical approach and incorporating Keynes and kalatsky into that approach so expected profits determine firm's output levels at the beginning of the production period. Then consumption and investment expenditures exposed realize the values created in the production sphere in the production period. And then the expected profits will fully determine realized profits because expectations determine expenditures and expenditures, especially expenditures with investment they will realize the values produced in production and then they will realize the profit rates. So it determines current profits. Okay, so that's how you go from expectations about profits in the future to the determination of profits in the present moment because expectations of about future profitability determine investment expenditures and those investment expenditures realize the values produced today in production and then you realize the values produced in production such that you realize the current profit rate so to summarize the expected profit rate fully determines the current profit rate so expenditures are partially autonomous from surplus value but surplus value is not autonomous from expenditures because you need expenditures to realize value and surplus value now, one idea that I took from Kalatsky and from Claudio Sardoni is that I'm going to, let's say, translate what they said uh, to a Marxist uh, framework, okay? Because they are talking about, so Kalatsky is developing his ideas and then Claudio Sardoni is comparing uh, Keynes, uh, to Keynes, sorry, Keynes to Kalatsky and then to Marx. So I'm just going to let's say, present their ideas using the language that I use in the paper, uh, the Marxist language. So the idea is the following. Capitalists as a class cannot realize more surplus value on the aggregate than their own investment expenditures. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much workers are exploited at the point of production, the realized uh, surplus value cannot be greater than the capitalist's expenditure with investment. Okay, that's an idea that comes from Kaletsky. And after reading uh, Claudio Sardone's book, that idea became much more uh, clear to me. Not just his book, but his papers too. So no matter how large the rate of exploitation uh, in the production sphere, the capitalist class can only realize a rate of exploitation that makes total profits match their own expenditures. All right, so what I'm saying is basically what Kaletsky said, but I'm using the, I'm just incorporating Kaletsky's idea into the Marxist framework, okay? So again, 
no matter how large the rate of exploitation is in the production sphere, the capitalist class can only realize a rate of exploitation that makes total profits match their own expenditures. And what I do in the paper too uh, is that I make technical change or um, the, the choice of technology to depend on the profit rate differentials between companies employing the old and new techniques. So basically what I have is a replicator equation that and that's an idea that I took from Professor Eleuterio Prado. Um, he's a Brazilian professor. Uh, I believe he's uh, retired now, but he continues to do research. He was my professor when I was doing my master's in, in at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And Professor Eleuterio Prado presented to me the idea of the replicator equation. And in, in two of his papers, he was using the, the replicator equation to to model the creation of um, price of production and also the adoption of new techniques of production across companies with different um, different techniques. So what I do in the paper is to develop those ideas a little bit more, to uh, use more maths and, and then to incorporate Keynes and Kaletsky into a Marxist framework. So it's a dynamic model over time. Um, but I use this idea that you can use the replicator equation to model technical um, the adoption of new techniques of production based on profit rate differentials between companies using old techniques and companies using new techniques. So basically what happens is that as a new technique is developed, the profit rate associated with that new technique is much higher than the profit rate associated with the old technique because the 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 newer technique is capital intensive but labor saving and it increases labor productivity so much that uh, it cut costs so the average cost reduces it decreases and companies have a profit incentive to adopt the new technology and basically what happens is that once the new technique is invented, there is a huge gap between the profit rate associated with the new technique and the profit rate associated to the old technique. And that's a price signal. It's a profit rate signal for the companies to gradually adopt the new techniques. So I have the introduction of new techniques and then over time, this technique is gradually adopted by the companies in the sector across different sectors. Uh, but the main point here is that technical change becomes itself endogenous to effective demand because technical change depends on profitability, right? So on expected profitability, but expected profitability, um, which determines current profitability, also depends on effective demand. So what happens is that effective demand is actually determining the... Uh, technical change and the adoption of new techniques. So when you have that, once technical change becomes endogenous to effective demand, what is happening is that because it's a dynamic model, the conditions of production become endogenous to demand and to expectations. So commodity values, so labor values, and socially necessary labor time cannot be determined solely flow from the supply side. Okay, so, and one of the things that I, you know, I'm using Isaac Rubin here, he was a Soviet uh, Marxist, uh, also a victim of uh, Joseph Stalin himself. Um, so Isaac Rubin wrote this wonderful uh, book, I believe in the 1930s, I guess. I forgot the, the publication date, the original publication date. Um, and his book was translated to English. It's about value theory in Marx, Isaac Rubin. I, I think it's something like essays in, in value theory. Um, and one of the things that he says in the book is that value that is not realized is not value. And then he explains why. And that's the, that's the idea that I'm using here. Okay, Value that is not realized is not value. In the paper, I, I explain why I do that. I quote Isaac Rubin, uh, I quote Marx um, to substantiate this claim, okay? So for me, value that is not realized is not value. For value to be value, it has to be realized. Um, 
so once we accomplish this integration uh, of Keynes and Kalecki into the Marxist framework, then the rates of exploitation uh, become endogenous to demand and to expectations. The realized rate of exploitation, which is an exposed concept, uh, differs from the rate of exploitation at the point of production, which is ex ante. That's what I mentioned before, right? So uh, in the paper, I have this quote from Marx in which he clearly says there, there is a rate of exploitation at the point of production before exploitation is realized in the market. And there is a second rate of exploitation, which is not identical to the first, which is the realized rate of exploitation, which is exposed after the market has, has realized the values that were produced in the production sphere. So those two rates of exploitation are not identical, even though they might be numerically equal, they could be numerically equal if the values produced in production are realized, exposed in the market. Okay? So the realized rate of exploitation can be numerically equal to the rate of exploitation at the point of production if the values produced in the production sphere are realized, right? But those two rates of exploitation are not identical and they could numerically differ in case the values produced in production are not realized in the market. And then what happens is that the long run prices of production become endogenous to demand and to expectations. And that, 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 that is the title of the paper, right? So I, I show you the connections between uh, prices of production and uh, effective demand. So, but, but that's the main argument. Um, the long run price of production, which are long run concepts become endogenous to something that is short run, which is the demand and expectations. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in the literature and also doing several simulations of, of my evolutionary model is that price of production under SAS law are more likely to be globally unstable. So once you introduce, oh, by the way, sorry. And why does that happen? Because the profit rates depend on quantities produced. Okay. So when you have SAS law, the profit rates depend on quantities produced. And because of that feature, the the price of production are more likely to be unstable in the long run if you assume sales law so the solution that i'm proposing which is to make long run price of production dependent on effective demand actually increases the likelihood the probability that the price of production will be globally stable okay so long run, to make it clear, so long run prices of production are more likely to be globally stable under the principle of effective demand. And this is one thing that I noticed by doing several simulations of, of my evolutionary model. Why? Because the profit rates now depend on quantities purchased and not on quantities produced, right? So when the model assumes that the profit rate depends on quantities produced, regardless <laughs> if they are sold or not, because you're, you're basically assuming sales law, so they are produced and sold, then uh, the likelihood of price of production being globally unstable are, are higher. So if you do the opposite, if you assume sales law, uh, if you assume uh, Keynes' uh, principle of effective demand, then the likelihood of getting globally stable uh, price of production is actually higher because the profit rates depend on actually on on quantities actually purchased, not produced. Um, I won't show you, as I said before, I won't show you any equations at this point. I just want to show you uh, one of the simulations, which is the simulation that is included in the model um, that I did. So. Um, let me get the pointer option here. So here in, in the first panel here, you have the average profit rates. So you have sector one here, which is the green line, then sector two. Uh, so sector one produces means of production, just like in Marx and Kaletsk. So sector one produces means of production, sector two produces consumption goods, uh, and companies can freely move from one sector to the other. So I have th three replicator equations. 
I have one replicator equation inside sector one, which is the sector that produces capital goods, uh, means of production. So that replicator equation uh, mimics the gradual uh, adoption of new techniques of production based on price rate differentials. So the new technique has a higher, temporarily higher uh, profit rate because with the new technique, uh, you save on labor. It's more capital intensive, but you save on labor and then you can cut costs. So the average cost goes down. So your profit margin goes up. But as more companies copy the technology that you have, your profit rate goes down because the other your competitors are also incorporating your technology. So the profit rate gradually goes down. And then what happens is that that process happens in sector one, producing means of production, but that also happens in sector two, producing, uh, producing means, uh, sorry, consumption goods. So you have the gradual adoption of new techniques of, techniques of production in sector one and in sector two, so for capital goods and for consumption goods. And there is a third replicator equation across sectors which mimics the entry and exit of firms across sectors so if one company believes so sorry if one company sees actually sees that the profit rate in that sector in which the company is operating is lower than the profit rate that it would get in the other sector the company exits the sector and joins the other sector so it reduces supply when it leaves in that sector and then it increases supply in the other sector when it joins the other sector Okay, so there are three replicator equations. The first replicator equation models the adoption of new techniques of production in sector one, producing means of production. The second replicator equation models technological diffusion in sector two, producing consumption goods. So basically you have this mix of companies operating with new technologies which are um, capital intensive labor saving technology that cut average costs and increase profit margins for the early adopters in both sectors so you have within sector competition and i model this within sector competition using two replicator equations one for each sector and then you have a third repl replicator equation that models the movement of capital of companies across sectors okay so you have within sector competition within each sector and then you have between sector competition and that is modeled uh, with a third replicator equation that shows the entry and exit of firms across sectors so the total number of firms is is given so i basically model the share of companies in sector one and the share of companies in sector two and then the share of companies in sector one with new technology and then the share with old technology and then in sector two the share with new technology and then the share of companies with old technology and because i'm working with the evolution of shares over time uh, the replicator equation comes in handy because the replicator e equation is meant to model the evolution of population shares, okay? Uh, so we don't model explicitly the size of the population. I just say it's a very large population, I have perfect competition, and I model the evolution of the shares. Shares of technology and then shares of uh, production in each, in each sector. So in the first uh, panel here, you have the evolution of the profit rate in both sectors, the orange line, is the average profit rate uh, in the economy. You can see that it falls over time uh, and you can see that the sector profit rates equalize towards this average profit rate uh, across sectors. In panel B here, you have uh, the share of companies in, in sector two and then the share of companies in sector one. Now in panel C, you have the share of companies using the new technology so it goes up gradually and then you have the share of companies using the old technology in panel d you have something similar this is in sector two you have the share of companies using the new technology so you see that the adoption of the new technology has a sigmoid shape it's that that is exactly what the replicator equation produces and then you have the share of companies using the old technology, so it goes down over time. Uh, in panel E, you have the profit rate associated with old 
and new technologies in sector one okay and then here in panel f you have the profit rates associated with the new and old technologies in sector two and as you can see here there is only one technology but at this point here t equals 100 i introduce a new technology and then the companies using the new technology they observe a huge spike in their profit rate okay but then as more companies adopt that technology then the profit rate associated with the new technology actually goes down because more and more companies are adopting the new technology and the profit rate associated with the old technology keeps going down and actually becomes negative okay because the zero line is here so these values here are negative for sector two that produces consumption goods it's uh, something similar so companies are using the same technology and then at time 50 t equals 50 i introduce a new technology and the profit rate associated uh, with the new technology shoots up so there's a huge spike for those companies adopting the new technology uh, but as more and more companies adopt as you can see here as more and more companies adopt the new technology the profit rate associated with the new technology goes down okay and the profit rate associated with the old technology also keeps going down it's actually negative the zero line is here so but but you see that in any case there is a gap between the new and the old technology so this is the gap okay and this is the gap here too so because there is a gap here this gap is the incentive for companies to keep adopting the new technologies uh, in panel g here I have the real wage okay so the real wage is endogenous so Okishu's theorem no longer applies because Okishu's theorem that shows that profit rates rise over time but it assumes a constant real wage does not apply here because the real wage is endogenous to effective I'm sorry uh, the real wage is endogenous to effective demand so the real wage is endogenous the distribution the functional distribution of income is endogenous too so the uh, so Kishu's theorem no longer applies and we get that the average profit rate falls over time um, the profit rates um, in both sectors are also uh, plotted here so the blue line is the average profit rate in sector two the green line is the average profit rate in sector one and then finally in panel H you have the distribution of value added between the wage share and then the profit share okay and I let the model run for 200 time periods uh, here in this um, it's related to the simulation in the previous uh, slide here I show how labor values so this is uh, the labor value of the machines of the capital goods in sector one and this is the labor value of the consumption goods um, how they are sensitive to to effective demand so beta here if you look at the paper beta is animal spirits so it's a coefficient in the investment function and gamma one and gamma two are coefficients in the investment function too so beta is animal spirits gamma one and gamma two are sensitivity is the sensitivity of investment to previous profit rates right so the current level of investment expenditure depends on the realized uh, profit rate um, and that sensitivity of current investment to past profit rates is captured by gamma one and gamma two so all these three coefficients here beta animal spirits gamma one and gamma two the sensitivity of investment to prior profits are in the investment function so here I show that when I change the coefficients in the investment function animal spirits and sensitivity to profit rate then uh, the labor values also change okay so the absolute values the absolute levels of the labor values change and also the the relative labor values so lambda one divided by lambda two um, and here I show how these are long run um, states 
okay so these are all fixed points so everything depicted here is a long run fixed point um, so it's a long run state as I say here um, so everything that is blue is a stable and everything that is let's say dark red is unstable okay so these are all fixed points um, P1 is the price of production of the machines uh, P2 is the price of production of consumption goods and here it's the ratio between P1 and P2 okay so in this first row here you have price of production uh, absolute levels and then here the 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 relative ratio right so it's the ratio of one price of production to the other E1 is the rate of exploitation in sector 1 E2 it's the rate of exploitation in sector 2 and here you have the ratio of the rates of exploitation F1 is the share of companies in sector 1 um, R tilde is the is the long run average profit rate for the whole economy V1 is the share of companies in sector 1 that adopt the new technology and the purpose of this plot um, is to show you how the long run states first they depend on beta and beta is the level of animal spirits okay you have to look at the paper to see the equation how we do it mathematically it's 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 easy it's not complicated so i'm basically showing that if you change animal spirits you change the level and the ratios of the long run states and then i use co uh, color coding to show which long run states are stable and which ones are unstable okay so blue for stable and dark red to to indicate instability okay and in the next slide i do exactly the same okay so it's the same as before so you have price of production here price of production sector 2 here uh, the ratio of prices of production and here the rate of exploitation in sector one rate of exploitation in sector two the ratio of rates of exploitation share of capital in sector one uh, average uh, profit rate in the entire economy and then here the share of companies adopting the new technology in sector one so it's the same plot as before i use the same color coding blue is stable and then dark red is unstable these are all fixed points okay all fixed all long run equilibrium points so there are fixed points well, and here instead of having beta i have gamma gamma is the sensitivity of investment to past profitability and here i show how if you change the sensitivity of investment to profitability you also change the 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 values and the relative ratios of the um, long run states okay that means that labor values and prices of production are sensitive to effective demand that's basically what i'm showing okay so these three slides they show you how labor values and prices of production are sensitive to effective demand in the short run clear and here finally that's the last plot that i have for you uh, it's a screenshot that I took from the paper uh, these are all uh, fixed points these are all long-run equilibrium so the dark regions here they indicate instability okay so these dark regions here they are um, equilibria that are uh, globally unstable okay so all these regions are globally unstable and the bright regions means so the bright regions indicate stability the prices of production are stable and the profit rates equalize okay so bright regions indicate that price of production are attractors of market prices okay dark regions instability bright regions uh, stability the axes here of this uh, three-dimensional cubes here are uh, coefficients in the in the models okay so i want to explain to you the meanings of these coefficients i would just 
pointed out that uh, these are all exogenous coefficients in the model. So basically here I'm changing simultaneously the values of the coefficients. So that's why I have three dimensional cubes. Uh, it was a hard time for my computer to draw this in these three dimensional cubes because basically within each cube you have mm, thousands, hundreds of thousands of points and each point is a fixed point. So basically within each figure you have I believe almost 400,000 simulations. Okay, again to produce each cube here you have you can see the points here right so do you see the points here you see this these are all points so each point within the cube is one simulation of the model using a specific combination of the coefficients okay so each point in the cube is a specific long run fixed point using a particular combination of the values of these coefficients but to produce each figure i simulate the model almost 400,000 times over so each cube here has f almost 400,000 points and each point is a fixed point it's a long run equilibrium given by produced by different combinations of these coefficients in the model clear so that's how I how I how I construct these regions of stability and instability okay I try different combinations of the coefficients I see how the model produces a fixed point and then I check if the fixed point is stable or unstable and I do that 400,000 times over for and and these are when I say simultaneous is because I'm changing the coefficients simultaneously instead of changing one at a time okay and that's why you need to produce these three-dimensional um, figures the main message is the following it's it's not the case it's not the case that price of production are always stable okay and I think price of production are only meaningful in theory like in economic theory if they are stable okay because for me as I understand it now uh, if the prices of production are not globally stable, then I don't see the point of, um, you know, what is the what is the importance of price of production if they are not globally stable. So I only care about the price of production if they are actually globally stable, because if they are globally stable, then these prices of production are attractors, they are long-run attractors for market prices, assuming perfect competition. Okay, everything that I said... Uh, all the simulations uh, assumes perfect competition. Uh, uh, now I'm developing another paper in which I do everything again, but using imperfect competition. Okay, I believe these results are also valid if you have imperfect competition, not just perfect competition. So the figures show that for certain combinations of the coefficients, then price of production in the bright regions, they are attractors of market prices, but not always only in the bright regions in the dark regions then the prices of production they are not attractors of market prices and um, then I don't see what is the, the importance of pr price of production another discussion which is what I'm going to discuss in the in this new paper that I'm uh, actually working on right now is what is the meaning if there is any meaning at all of price of production when you have imperfect competition because so far at, at this moment I, I could understand the meaning of prices of production when you have perfect competition and those price of production are globally stable such that market prices converge to price of production in the long run right so that's the idea price of production work as long run attractors as uh, centers of gravity for market prices in the long run if you have perfect competition another question is do we have prices of production when we have imperfect competition all right so it's a question that i'm trying to 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 understand better now uh, maybe we have to use a different definition of price of production for example um, i remember seeing this uh, alternative definition because the standard definition is that price of production 
exist when uh, profit rates are equalized across sectors. But if you have imperfect competition, then maybe the definition of price of production are the prices that do not cause any further changes in, in entry and exit of firms across sectors, right? So again, the canonical way to define price of production when you have perfect competition is to say, okay, you get price of production when profit rates equalize, clear across sectors. But if you have imperfect competition, then you should expect profit rates not to equalize, okay? So in most cases, profit rates will not equalize across sectors because you have imperfect competition. So you have somehow uh, entry, you have some types of uh, barriers to entry, entry barriers. Uh, maybe uh, the flow of capital across sectors is not free. Uh, maybe you have patents, maybe you have monopoly power, right? So when you have these types of market power associated with whatever, patents, uh, natural monopolies, technological monopolies, information rents, then we should expect profit rates not to equalize across sectors. And when you look at the empirical evidence, um, you will see that profit rates don't equalize. So what, what, what you actually get is that you have a distribution, you have a probability distribution of profit rates across sectors, and there's a single peak, so it stands shaped. Um, so I have seen some papers by Alice, Sha Sh sorry if I mispronounced the name, Alice Schaffernacker and Duncan Foley and Gregor Semyonik, who have shown that um, actually competition between companies and across sectors leads to a tent shaped distribution, which is uh, very similar to the Laplace distribution. So you have a, an equilibrium probability distribution of profit rates. So what achieves an equilibrium um, is not like equalized profit rates. What is an equilibrium is the shape of the probability distribution function of those profit rates. Uh, that's what I have seen from the empirical literature is, again, it's not that profit rates equalize, okay? Because you have uh, market power, you have all these things that prevent profit rates from equalizing to a single value. So what is actually relevant empirically is some type of imperfect competition that, that produces this tent shaped. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like this, uh, it's like this, right? So it's tent shaped or more like this. So it's a single peak, right? So what is an equilibrium is actually the statistical distribution of the profit rates. Um, and um, so maybe I could use this uh, alternative definition that says that if you have this, if you have imperfect competition, then the best definition of price of production is not the definition that comes from perfect competition, which is when pr uh, profit rates equalize across sector sectors. Maybe the best definition of price of production when you have imperfect competition is when uh, you achieve an equilibrium in terms of entry and exit of firms across sectors. So prices of production is just an idea. Price of production in imperfect competition would be the market prices that induce no further movement of firms across sectors. Okay. Um, so what I said in, uh, in this presentation is published in the SCAD journal Structural Change and Economic Dynamics in 1921, Volume 58. Uh, that is the title of uh, the publication, Effective Demand and Price of Production, An Evolutionary Approach. Um, and here is the link to the paper. It's also available on my website if you're interested in these topics. So, um, and just to make clear, uh, what I said here applies to perfect competition. Now I'm trying to develop a similar approach but assuming imperfect um, competition okay so thank you very much for watching and uh, the slides and the paper are available and this video too are available on my personal website thomasrata.wordpress.com thank you for watching and um, if you're interested 
in 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 this topic uh, you can shoot me a message you can find my email address on my websites so uh, please write to me whether or not you agree with the things that i said but if you want to engage with this uh, debate i'm open to i think i'm very open-minded to different ideas so you can write to me um, telling me if you agree or if you disagree with the ideas that i have developed in this paper and that I have presented in this in this video okay thank you for watching and uh, I, hopefully I will get a message from you thank you for watching bye bye